Now, that looks much prettier, okay. I won't be ashamed to invite Miss Martha Olson, right, Martha? It looks better, right? Okay. All right, I know, my, my children are wonderful, but they have to be ordered around a little, <laughs> like my mother did. Okay, we were telling mother stories here before. Ooh, who's that? <laughs> okay. Are you all here? Good afternoon, everyone. How many are you all from my registered class? Raise your hand. Oh, oh, how beautiful, yes. And do I have any FMM students here? Raise your hand. Oh, very nice, good, good, okay. Well, did you have a good weekend? Good. Now you're all ready for uh, learning something that will be uh, very valuable for your future. Uh, Ms. Martha Olson is uh, the president, as the posters have said, and they made a mistake on the post. I almost died. They wrote fall 2008 in the small print, and I didn't catch it. Should be spring 2009. These things happen. So uh, I just wanted to tell you that uh, for me, it's really an honor and a pleasure to have Miss Martha Olson because I too have uh, many years in the intimate apparel, as you know if you read my little uh, blurb on the uh, course outline. I was the print designer, color developer for Vanity Fair, starting with the first leopard print that was ever done. So my life is very, very close to the intimate apparel world, a wonderful world that gave me so much joy all those years of creativeness. And it's, it's, it's a special industry. It's different from other areas of fashion. And uh, I want to tell you a little about Miss uh, Olson. Miss Olson, Martha Olson, joined Warnico in November 2004 as president core brands and assumed responsibility for Calvin Klein underwear U.S. in September 2008. She is responsible for all aspects of the company's intimate apparel brands, including Calvin Klein, which you saw, underwear, both men's and uh, uh, women's, Warner's, Olga and Olga's Christina. Previously, she spent 10 years at Sara Lee Corp their intimate apparel unit in executive marketing and general management positions, including president of Ralph Lauren Intimates, Ms. Olson, General Mills, and uh, Nestle, and Nestle, that's the way, Nestle. Okay, accent aigu. She holds an MBA from the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. And I won't say another word because I want you to meet Miss Martha Olson and hear from her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you can remove that. No, that's, that's okay. Okay, can everyone hear me? I'm probably close enough. You could probably hear me with, without this since everybody moved down. Okay. Um, well, thank you for coming, and it was such a pleasure to um, receive the inv invitation to be here. And I actually learned something um, today, uh, you know, because I didn't didn't realize that your professor was responsible for leopard prints. But I will tell you that there has not been, I think, in the history of intimate apparel, a leopard print that didn't sell. I mean, that, that is what you know. Colors don't sell. So, you know, sometimes that particular pink or blue or red or and yellow, not a good intimate color, but, but um, oftentimes they might not sell, but leopard always sells. So I didn't realize that we owed that all to her. Um, it, it, it is a great um, you know, honor to be here. And when I saw the list of other, other guest speakers that you've had, I, I thought, oh, wow, I have to follow Diane von Furstenberg. It's like, you know, that, that's a little, a little tough. So, um, because I, I will tell you up front, and I, I, I am not a designer, um, and I, I probably don't have the creative skills of, of all of you in this room. Um, my background is much more the business side of it. But I will also tell you that, and I didn't start my career in, in fashion either. I started my career in consumer packaged goods with companies like 
General Mills and Nestle. So I wa worked on brands like Cheerios and Betty Crocker and Bisquick and Toll House. Those were always good show product showings. I will quickly add the Toll House ones. But, but um, I, you know, and I moved to the fashion industry in a business role and, and had never looked back. So even someone who you know, spends most of her day looking at spreadsheets and numbers and profit and loss statements and, and, and things like that can have a real passion for, this, for the fashion side of the industry, and in particular, intimate apparel, um, because it's just fast-paced, fun. The people have such high energy and passion for what we do every day. So, you know, it is an amazing conglomeration, if you will, of talents and backgrounds that actually will come together in a business. Um, so what I, what I, one of the things that before I start, I'm going to, how many of you had heard of Warnico as a company before? Oh, pretty good. Pretty good. And, but how about Calvin Klein? Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, Warnico, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about Warnico. Um, selfishly, that's, I guess, my commercial um, for the day. But I'll, but I'll give you a little bit of background about, about Warnico, just so, to give some perspective on that. But then I'm going to give you a profile of, of a pro new product launch, sort of soup to nuts of how that happened. And I, I picked an example from Calvin Klein underwear, in fact, in, in the men's underwear business. Um, and and because I thought that would be kind of interesting to see, you know, how did it actually happen to get from market to from you know kind of an idea to market? I'm not going to go through every step of the way, but just kind of give you how it really can be brought to life. Some of which you saw in the introductory video. Then I want to take a step back and kind of talk about the industry and how creativity can can change an industry and some of the things we might take for granted today in terms of intimate apparel and you know it's sort of you just accept it um, you know is really it happened as, as a course of history I mean and, and a history of creativity so sometimes that one idea any one of you might have can actually change an industry for the rest of history and you'll see that I think in some of the examples I, I chose and I chose just a few of the examples that exist out there so there are many many more besides the ones that um, I, I picked to sh share with you and then finally I'm going to share with you some profiles of some of the people who work at Warnico in intimate apparel and just give you a little bit of a flavor of their background because you know just as I took a different road and a course to end up uh, in intimate apparel and in, at Warnico specifically, each of them um, may have chosen a different path or, or come there in a different way. And I thought it might be interesting for you to see that it's not that, you know, I don't actually think there's one person in the division who woke up when they were in kindergarten and said, you know, I really want to work in intimate apparel or I want to work on women's underwear or men's underwear. It, it, you know, it just doesn't happen that way. So I thought you might find it kind of interesting to see the different paths that people people chose. Okay, so I'm going to hopefully, I didn't, try, um, all right, so look, just taking a quick look at Warnico today, Warnico is almost a two billion dollar company. So while, you, you know, for those of you who didn't raise your hands, that's, that's okay, um, because Warnico itself is not one of the brands per se, it's just this, the parent name of the company, but it's about $2 billion in revenue, and this was a 2007 number, so it's certainly grown since then. We have 5,000 employees around the world, um, and we have product distributed in 110 countries. So it is very much a global country. And you can see from the list all the different places that there are offices. So we, d we might distribute in a particular country. We, we may or may not have an office there. But we have people working primarily here in New York as it relates to some of the product development for the globe, as well as the US business. Um, but we have people, you know, we have a huge business in Hong Kong. We have a, in intimate apparel, we have a huge office in Hong Kong responsible for much of the product development that happens because so much of our product is made in Asia. Um, but you can see the different uh, other con con countries and cities where we do have company offices and, and so, some of those 5,000 employees. Warnico is a global leader in, in, in apparel businesses, and I'll show you um, some of the various brands uh, and channels of distribution that we operate into, but it, but it is a portfolio of brands, um, certainly dominated by Calvin Klein, um, but then Calvin Klein for us is a licensed brand. Um, 
Phillips Van Heusen actually owns the Calvin Klein brand, but we license it in two areas, in intimate apparel and in jeans. And we happen to actually own the license in intimate apparel, which simply means we can never lose that license. We will always be the provider of Calvin Klein uh, underwear, whether it's men's or women's, around the globe. Uh, certainly, international presence is something that has been important to the company, particularly as the world has has changed and as, you know, and just even in these, uh, you know, difficult economic times, which is a global issue, um, but it was certainly a strategy of Warnico's to kind of spread the risk, if you will, from a portfolio standpoint and have an international presence. And certainly multi-channels multi of distribution, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, if you look at the brands, we, as I said, we have Calvin Klein, that we own it in underwear, we license it in jeans, we have jeans and accessories both in um, Europe and Asia, um, as well as swimwear and bridge apparel and accessories within Europe, and then we have the right for additional licenses and rights. So it's a very strong partnership with Philip Van Heusen. But we, all, we also have um, other brands in the, in the Warnico portfolio. A big chunk of our company is Speedo, and for those of you who watched the Olympics this past year, uh, the Laser Racer was an incredible um, part of the Olympics in terms of the swim events. We certainly supplied the Laser Racer to uh, the U.S. team, but also to any other team that wanted to, to swim and use this technology that was developed to make, you know, I mean, Michael Phelps st st stood there, or swam there, I guess stood is the wrong word, you know, and won his eight medals wo um, wearing the laser razor, but most of the medals that were won in the swim events were, wore, were also wearing the laser razor. And certainly, we're not going to sell that many laser razors. I mean, I, I don't even know how much they cost, but I, they're hun several hundreds of dollars. But it is the, the branding that that can create around the Olympics in terms of either swim teams as well as the recreational swimmer that becomes becomes important. CHAPS we license as well, and, and that's actually a license from the Polo Organization for North America, um, and so we have the CHAPS brand. Uh, and, and then the other side of my portfolio includes the, the rest of what we call core brands in intimate apparel, but those are all owned brands. So we own the Warner's brand, and that's really the kind of the heritage of Warnica, Warnica, Warner's. Um, that's really our heritage brand, uh, as well as Olga, which was an acquisition many years ago. I'm not even sure how many years ago, but quite some time ago, and then the body Nancy Gantz, which was a shapewear acquisition. So that's our portfolio of brands. And these are our channels of distribution. So we, we clearly have a, a stake in the department store channel, um, but we also play with specialties. A lot of that has to do with swimwear. We are in chain stores. That's a very big channel for the Warners and Olga brands. But we're also in the mass merchants and membership clubs, as well as, as I mentioned, international has become a much bigger uh, part of our uh, company portfolio. And so you can see some of the places that were distributed around the world, which, which includes some of the same, you know, same channel portfolio, if you will, uh, both department stores as well as mass. So, you know, it's again, from a corporate perspective, this is a strategy to be where the consumer is with the appropriate brand. So that Calvin Klein, for example, is not distributed in mass, but other brands would be. So our portfolio brands allows us to hit all of the channels of distribution that the consumer is shopping in. And the strategy is, is quite simple, actually. Um, we are certainly uh, a publicly traded company, so all of our jobs, whether we create product, whether we fit product, whether we distribute it, whether we you know, crunch numbers, no matter what role anyone plays, um, it's really to maximize shareholder value, and, and that really comes from maximizing profitability and sales by really leveraging the brands, because it really all comes down to the brands uh, and the power of the brands and the product that we have. So Calvin Klein is a growth engine for the company. We want to grow that geographically um, by expanding internationally as well as direct to consumer. And what that really is, in a nutshell, is e-commerce as well as freestanding stores. Um, much of that can be, uh, we see the freestanding stores around the globe. We only have one store here in the U.S. It happens to be down in Soho, um, but we also have the CKU.com for those of you who are going to run out after this and buy your Calvin Klein. Um, but also operational excellence, and, and all that simply means is that we 
you know, execute flawlessly, whether that is in the supply chain, whether that is in the design process, or whether that is in marketing. So operational excellence is really quite important because no matter how good the product is, if we really don't execute well, then either the consumer can't find it or it's not in her size or it's not where she's shopping or, or, or. Uh, and there's so many things that can go wrong. So that becomes very, very important. Now, just a, a quick look at the company. The, the, the pie chart up on the upper left is really the company. So if you look at it, half of our revenue comes from sportswear, which is, which is Calvin Klein jeans as well as chaps. About 16% from swimwear, and that's predominantly Speedo brand, and then 34% comes out of Intimate Apparel. So Intimate Apparel is, is near and dear to my heart, but it's obviously near and dear to the company's heart as well. And then if you just take that Intimate Apparel piece of the pie, about three quarters of it is Calvin Klein, and the other quarter is um, the core brands. And a lot of the reason for that kind of skew, if you will, is that Calvin Klein is global, whereas Warners and Olga are just here in the U in North America, I should say. We do have a presence in um, Mexico and in Canada on those brands. So just a, a quick look at, at what it looks like. I mean, in core brands then, I've told you the portfolio of brands, it is just North American distribution. It's about 160 million of that 2 billion. So a relatively small piece, you know, and it's, and it's key priority is gaining market share through product innovation. And obviously you here, you are here at FIT because you're, you have a passion for the product and the, and the creativity behind that. Well, that's where it begins. The other part of the strategy here uh, is channel expansion. So the change that you saw in terms of our distribution has been growing um, as well as some efforts that we have in the mass channel behind these brands. So it's really a place where we can grow market share when we don't have the same geographic opportunities. Calvin Klein is a much, much bigger business, predominantly because it is not only here in the U.S. is it bigger, but it has the geographic um, distribution worldwide, and it is also dual gender. So it's men and women, and we, we make both of those. Um, and again, it's the same priority. It's, there's a theme here. It's increased market share through product innovation and powerful marketing. So product, it always begins with the product, um, as well as geographic expansion and direct-to-consumer. So those are, are avenues, again, to take the product where the consumer is shopping, but it still begins with the product and the marketing behind that product. I, if, you, if you were here early enough to see the video, um, you know, you saw Mark Wahlberg, you know, and, and before Calvin Klein, he really was not well known. I mean, he, you see him now, and it's kind of reminiscence, but if you saw the product that was on, particularly the woman where it was, you know, it was definitely a different era of, of underwear, um, you know, he really, you know, became a name through that. I mean, Brooke Shields, it was a jeans ad, but nothing comes between me and my Calvins. Uh, every, uh, people still know that, and, and many of you in the room probably never saw it on, you know, when it, when it actually aired on TV, but that made a name for Brooke Shields. So Calvin Klein as a brand really has created a number of the, you know, of names within um, the industry from an, from an acting and talent standpoint in terms of the marketing. Okay, so now I'm going to just take you through kind of the elements of a successful launch. And this is, again, just meant to be, you know, an example of what happens. But, but there's really, it's, as I said, it always starts with the product. But we look at this pyramid and said, well, it can't just be product. It can't end there. There's packaging. There's point of sale. There's things that happen in the store when, when he or she is making a decision. There, there can be consumer events behind it, public relations, and of course, advertising. So people always think of the product and think of the ads you see, but there's a whole lot in between that can make um, can make a, a launch. So uh, we'll start with the product. I'm going to take you through just a quick snapshot of each of those elements of the pyramid. And the example that I chose is Calvin Klein Steel, which was a men's underwear program. It was launched in, uh, at the end of July in 2007. So that means we shipped it in, at the end of July 2007. 725 tends to be the date that, cons that the retailers take product, and it has to do with how they manage inventory, which means it probably got on at retail sometime in August or early September. Um, this was a microfi microfiber as well as a cotton program. It had the thinnest waistband, and I don't mean this way thin. I mean like the 
with the around the body. So it was very, very thin. Um, it was, but it was high, and so that the the brandy and Calvin Klein would just pop right off the waistband. And and there, to make it that thin was was a particular equipment that was not available. It was unique to us, and we just happened to lock it all up so that we could have exclusivity on the product when it was launched. So we knew that no one there might be look-alike copies, but no one would actually be able to l deliver something that was quite that thin and had the functionality of this waistband. Um, and waistbands, by the way, uh, you know, for the, since I have no experience, um, personal experience in the category, that's what it's all about in, in men's underwear. But at the same time, a couple of new silhouettes were introduced. Um, in silhouettes meaning, you know, just the, the, the um, actual form that the product took. So it had, it had new, better fabrics. It had a new waistband that we could have uh, that would be unique and exclusive. It had new silhouettes. You know, so there was a lot going on there uh, from a product standpoint. So, so we felt that we had something that was unique and would be meaningful and command um, the, the price at, and get, get him or or her um, to purchase the underwear. The packaging also, because men's underwear tends to be boxed, there's kind of the good news, bad news here. It's in a box, which means if it's better fabric, it's not readily tactile um, at, at point of purchase, but it's in a box, which means you get a billboard. Because if it's just hanging on a hanger, there's no you might have a hang tag, but sometimes those aren't seen. So again, it was a very different packaging look. It was called steel, so it had to look like steel. Um, and obviously, steel conjured up all kinds of Im images of Superman and the Man of Steel and, and all kinds of things going on there to make this patch package stand out. Um, the sales team traveled around the country meeting with all the heads of visual um, for our major retailers to create visual point of sale so that when he or she walked into the department's underwear department, they couldn't miss it. Um, and so whether that was mannequins, whether that was, you know, you can see the, the posters that were put right on the um, elevators, whatever it was that, that, that the team worked out with, with the visual team in retail made it very iconic when, when the shopper came into the store. And then there were events. I mean, there were, there were hosted events throughout many of the major stores, not every store, because many of the stores out in you know, the hinterlands are, it, it's not, it's not going to be worth that kind of investment. But certainly the big stores in big metropolitan areas and major cities had events going on. There were consumer events happening around the country. So the van that, you know, that has the, the, the models with steel, all of that was happening at the same time of the launch. PR was critical, uh, obviously having Paris Hilton wear men's underwear, and on on, this happens to be a European magazine, but, but that kind of publicity is incredible because you can't miss the branding uh, from that standpoint. And then to top it off, that very top of the pyramid, which is advertising, uh, Jaiman, who, if the, for those of you who saw Blood Diamond, yes? People, the, the movie. I mean, Jaiman is the the actor in that movie. It, it was this launch, you know, kind of came right on the heels of the movie, so he was quite well known and highly recognizable. And outdoor print, ROP, which is Ranger Press's newspaper ads, as well as direct mails that went right into mailboxes with Jaiman modeling the product certainly caught attention. Um, and, and Steel was probably one of the biggest launch in, launches in Calvin Klein underwears, the men's underwear history, um, in terms of size, scale, and just it just instantly overnight uh, sold and and was and met all and beat all expectations. So the launch, you know, it, it product is critical, but it's all the other other elements that can get the product in, into the consumer's hand. Okay, I, I want to take a take a step now and, and and kind of back in time, if you will, and just give you a sense of how creativity can really revolutionize an industry and change it. It's not just about the next prettiest bra or the next, you know, waistband uh, on on men's underwear, but creativity can show itself in many many different ways, and it's never easy. Um, and it, every idea isn't going to be one of these ideas. And sometimes, the, you know, an idea you think is going to be one of these ideas isn't. And, and obviously, the learning that comes from that is just as critical. 
Um, but here are just a few examples of how the industry changed um, through one piece of creativity. And, and I didn't just pick Warnico creativity, but it just so happens by, you know, half and chance that many of these are examples that came out of our company. Um, but if we think of bras, and for those of, you know, particularly the women in the room, whether you've, whether you've worked in intimate apparel and, and studied it, you know, it's, it's, it, there's a number and a letter. You know, and that's the sizing. Well, before 1935, there were no letters. It was just, you know, the, the width or the circumference around a woman's body, and you can imagine that it was a very different look. Um, and someone in the design studio of Warnico at the time basically call, came up with what was called the alphabet bra. So keep in mind, the consumer had never heard such a thing. So if you think of that pyramid, I mean, here's a bra that not suddenly puts dimension behind sizing and, and better shaping, frank, frankly. Um, and, and it was cleverly called the, a, the alphabet bra, and it created the cup sizes A, B, C, et cetera. Um, you know, it was made in a series of sizes corresponding, you know, keep it simple. Um, so it was really corresponding with the letters of the alphabet, and now you can't, unless it's a sports bra, I mean, you, you know, which is small, medium, large, or something that really doesn't, those, some of us would say doesn't really qualify as a bra, you can't buy a bra that isn't cup-sized. It, it just doesn't exist. So, so someone took a chance. Obviously, this was the ad, by the way, that launched it, so clearly um, a different time period um, in 1935, but it was the ad that launched the alphabet bra, um, and certainly the industry has never been the same, and, and obviously every, custom, every competitor has, has now you know, quickly adapted that. Straps that stretch. I mean, you think again, if you think to your own personal experience. Before, and this one actually, 30, 1935, I mean, that's like, I don't even remember that, right? Because I wasn't even around then. But, but 63, I do remember, I hate to admit. Um, but before 1963, all straps were rigid. And, you know, I mean, they just, you know, there was this thing that flapped, actually. Um, and Warner's incorporated, again, War Warner's was always kind of on the forefront of this, but they incorporated the first stretch strap into a bra. And, and now, again, you might have bras that have some rigidity in the strap for support, for, particularly in fuller figure, but there's always a stretch element to them. And, you know, and, and Warner's it created this in 1963. Um, last month, actually, the brand, and this is, of course, a little bit of, of um, pride for me, but the brand introduced a new stretch strap that actually doesn't need adjusting. Um, so that you don't have to have that little lump and bump in the back, particularly in the back. Um, so it's a strap that has, has the modulus that allows it to adapt to whatever, you know, if someone's taller or shorter uh, within reasonable um, uh, dimensions, um, and, and it doesn't need any kind of adjusting. So it's it is like the perfect t-shirt bra because there's, it's not just about um, smooth, it's about smooth including the strap. And, and it has been an unbelievable uh, success for the business um, and my team on the Warner's brand. So it's, it's like in 63, they were, they were all rigid. The, the brand created the stretch strap, but somebody said, you know, I think we can do it a different way. Uh, and that little spark of creativity probably, and in fact, I know this, that um, it was about two and a half years ago that someone said, what if what if we could do it where we really didn't? And everybody said it can't be done because some women are tall and some are short. So that creativity can really spark a change. And we, we are, uh, you, know, and you know, we're taking that success and trying to expand on that, knowing that our competition is probably, will be soon behind us, and that may change the industry. The next one I think you'll, you'll find a little bit fun. But before the 1980s, there were no thongs. They were introduced in the 80s, not, I mean, not that long ago, actually. And, and they, were, they were not, it was not a big player in the panty market. I mean, it was sort of, you know, kind of one of those odd things, like, you know, you didn't even admit. Um, but it was the 1990s, and we all know the story, uh, where thongs gained their notoriety uh, in the White House. And today, it's 20% of the panty market. So it didn't exist in the 1980s, and someone said, Panty lines is a problem, here's a way to solve them. Uh, not necessarily looking like that one, but, you know. <laughs> 
I'll go back a little bit further in time. Vanity Fair has a style called Illuminations. And this is probably, you know, mid-90s that this was introduced. Illumi Before that, Illuminations, really, most bras were on what we would call in the industry unlined, meaning they could have two, they could be two ply, but there was no foam. And foam doesn't necessarily mean padded, but it's, it's, there's a modesty factor to foam, there's a shaping factor to foam, but there really were no foam bras. So it was in the mid-90s that Vanity Fair introduced illuminations and changed the industry again. Because today, I, you know, I wish you luck to find a bra that is, does not have a foam cup. I mean, it's, it's difficult because the consumer completely migrated to foam because it was a consumer need that was not being met. And, and, and this was, she, you know, it was, she wanted the modesty and the shaping that foam could give her, but it, it didn't, she didn't want to have dimension um, and, or, you know, added size from a bra. So again, you know, just not that, not really all that long ago, and today, it is, it is the dominant um, factor within bras. The boxer brief and Marky Mark. Um, this was again in the 1990s. Mark Wahlberg became the Calvin Klein spokesperson. He really wasn't well known before that. I mean, Calvin has kind of this history. I don't know, how many of you saw 30 Rock last week? I mean, I, I was like, so, so you saw Calvin Klein, right? I mean, I, I was, I've never watched it before. To, I mean, I'm a, a, you know, true confessions here, but I'm like, what is all this about? And I just happened to watch it the night that, that John Hamm was walking down the street and there was a cameo appearance by Calvin Klein. He walked up to him and said, hi, you look great today. I'd like you to be my next underwear model. You know, it's like, well, you know, and it, it was Calvin. Um, but but uh, Mark Wahlberg was the, was the Calvin Klein spokesman in the 1990s, and again, it was behind a product introduction, so it was sort of that, you know, top of the pyramid of the, of the um, uh, top of the pyramid that I showed you, it, it may be what people remember in terms of the advertising, but he was launching a new style called the Boxer Brief, which was obviously a combination of the Boxer and the Brief, um, which today represent 22% of the $200 million department store industry uh, in the United States. So, uh, you know, a change, complete change to the industry through that one creative idea that, that took precedent. Um, seamless technology, I, for those, uh, particularly women in the room, I mean, how many, when's the last time you wore a pair, wore a pair of pantyhose? No one, right? I mean, like, what, what's pantyhose is probably the question in people's mind. Well, pantyhose happens to be a circular knit, right, to make the tube for the leg, put the two legs together, and all of a sudden there was all this equipment out there because women stopped wearing them. We wore pants, we, you know, we, we went without hose, um, and so somebody said, what are we going to do with all this equipment? So this one was kind of, some, and to some extent, an industry need, and that available capacity, the Bally Corporation, or the Sara Lee Corporation, where I spent 10 years of my career, was the, is the world's leading producer of pantyhose. So obviously an issue for the company. And someone said, I think we can cut the hose off and make, you know, somehow, you know, just it's not as simple as that, but kind of cut the hose off and make underwear. And that technology uh, launched a whole brand. And so it was, it was really, a, in some ways, a, a need of a company to use up capacity because there was this equipment that cost money. Um, and it's a little bit different equipment. I'm oversimplifying, but a whole brand was born called Barely There, which has since launched into bras and probably bras out pace pants for you know, the size of the business today. And then the last example that I was going to show you is, is really a company called Spanx. Um, and I'm going to guess that many of uh, the women in the room have heard of Spanx and Sarah Blakely. And it's a similar story to Seamless, the Seamless Pants story, um, except take, you know, dial fast forward in history. And she basic, Sarah basically had a need that said, I kind of want the control top, but I don't want the hose. And, and literally, she cut the hose off and started selling what she, what she called Spanx. I mean, quite, quite literally. I mean, that's not what's done today. Um, but she started this, her business up 
in two, the year 2000, Oprah declared it one of her favorite things. I mean, and if, uh, you know, if you can have an, I mean, my goal in life is to have something that Oprah endorses. I mean, that's just, it's a simple wish. Um, and I'm still working on it. But once Oprah says, you know, whether it's a book or whether it's Spanx, um, it became really an overnight. Everyone went out to, see, to find out what, what Oprah's secret was, because we all know her thing with weight. Um, and today they've sold uh, over five, almost five and a half million power pants, you know, based on that. And in, in a fairly short period of time, it's approximately $350 million, and, and that's an estimate simply because it's not a publicly traded company. Um, I wish I were Sarah Blakely. Um, but it just proves that, you know, the girdle can be modernized. I mean, you know, this, this was today's version of you know, what, what was, a, you know, an icon for, you know, many of your probably grandmothers. So, again, just to give you a, a little bit of a flavor that sometimes that one idea, and even in an industry that isn't quite the same fashion, you know, like pace that, that sportswear or ready-to-wear can have, an intimate apparel, and much more of a replenishment industry, but those creative ideas can actually change the industry forever. The last thing that I wanted to do, and then I'll open it up for any questions that you have, is just profile some of the different um, people that work within the Intimate Apparel team. Um, and, this, uh, and I chose the design and merchandising team, although I'm going to close with a, a reprise on my background to just show you that it, it isn't one mold. Um, but these are, the, these are people that um, created all those, or examples of people who create those kinds of creative ideas every day. Um, so I'm going to start with Don Allen. Uh, Don is our Vice President of Design on the core brand. So he works on Warner's and Olga. He has helped out on Calvin Klein when the pinch um, was there. He actually, you know, is probably one of the only people I think that I'm going to show you who grew up in the intimate apparel industry. His father was actually in sales and intimate apparel. So he grew up with it every day. Um, but he didn't, st you know, that, that was not a destiny for him necessarily. He got his BA in theater. Uh, he was a costume design major. Uh, and so he obviously learned to sew and he learned to design from that. Um, but, but through his father, he got his first job as a pattern grader. So, so he really learned the technology of it. Loved costume design, but didn't want to starve. And so migrated, you know, to, to stay in intimate apparel, starting with technology, but his real passion is creativity. And, and Don is part of my team. I mean, he is an amazing talent because he has both. He is highly, highly, highly creative. Don is the person who created the strap that I mentioned that we just launched in January and, and is off to an unbelievable start. He's got a litany of other um, you know, I would call him our R&D arm, if you will, but he is, a, he is a designer at heart. He leads our de design team. He inspires them. He single-handed, well, you know, almost single-handedly does our R&D. He is in Asia right now uh, working on ideas for the future. Um, he's been with Warnico 15 years. This is, you know, he obviously started in Sara Lee, where his father was, um, but he has spent 15 years in, the, in this industry, kind of on two stints. He actually left for a little period of time, went to um, a, another company that rhymes with Victoria uh, D. Crit, um, and then came back because he, he missed it. So I'm thrilled to have Don as part of the team, and, and he is just you know a, a force behind it. So um, that's one profile. Yarden is the vice president of design on the Calvin Klein side. So in essence, um, Don's counterpart on Calvin Klein, and he's got an international background. It's a diff very different background to Don. Uh, he oversees the global design, so his challenge is to meet the needs of the globe. And believe me, the intimate apparel, when I talked about foam cups changing it, that was a very much a U.S. perspective. In Europe and in France in particular, but France, Italy, um, foam bras are there, but it's much more about the lace and the, and the matching and the, you know, and the colors, and it's, it's, it's a different market there. Um, so he has to try and satisfy both sides of that. 
Uh, he, he does product development and design. He's been with Calvin Klein for 11 years. He is a citizen of Canada and Israel. So he, you know, for a, for a guy working global, he is global. Um, he, he earned his degree in Canada. Uh, he began his career in underwear, so he has been in this industry, um, but in men's underwear, in Israel, learning sort of the back room part of that business, um, not the design si side of it, but certainly, you know, he wanted to stay in this industry and, and really saw his talent more on the creative side. And so that's, you know, how he kind of came to be uh, in the role that he's, he's in. Melissa Romalga, is, she is an alumni of this uh, wonderful institution. Uh, she graduated in 2005, but didn't come here, um, you know, kind of automatically. I mean, she actually was a young, young, young high school grad. At 16, she, she started college in nursing. Logical that she's now a bra designer. Um, and, and, and I think, pretty, as she told me, she very quickly decided that really wasn't what she wanted to do. And she applied to FIT and was rejected because she had, of course, a science background. And so she, she said, well, what am I going to have to do to get into FIT? I want to be here. Um, she took a number of art classes. And a year and a half later, I mean, that's, that's you know, how mature this young, young woman was to say, no, this is really where I need to be. Um, and so she was accepted. Uh, you know, she, she came to FIT. She's worked in the fashion industry in various areas. Uh, it listed there, I mean, she was a seamstress, you know, vintage clothing. She, uh, Delta Galil is a supplier in intimate apparel, so she, she obviously learned some things there. She worked retail, anthropology, but she really decided that intimate apparel was where she wanted to specialize here because it really took that creative side as well as the technical side and put them together. Um, because it is a, in, bra, bra design is an engineering feat, actually, because, you know, it, it's not, there's no draping involved. So it actually has to fit, it has to support, and, and she liked that merger. And, and we hired her, Don Allen actually hired her. It was his vision to bring, you know, new fresh talent from, from here into the organization to, to also learn as they do. So she came in as an assistant designer. She was promoted about two years later to an associate designer. And she actually is now kind of our panty expert, but also um, designing bras as well. So Melissa is, is one of uh, your alums. Direct, more direct route, although through nursing. How do you, how do you like that? Um, Joanne Kay. Joanne, uh, Joanne and I have actually worked together twice. Um, Joanne is our VP of Merchandising and now Tech Design. We, simp we added that responsibility to her um, three months ago, I think now, on the core brand side, so Warners and Olga. Um, Joanne and I worked together when I was doing Ralph Lauren with Sara Lee. I actually hired Joanne at that time um, out of Victoria's Secret. Um, and then brought her to Sara Lee. She stayed at Sara Lee, and then I hired her again when I joined Warnico um, a little bit after that. She's actually got a, you know, a combination of uh, backgrounds. She has a, a BS in business economics from Skidmore, and she also has her MBA. Um, she was a fit model at one point for Leslie Juniors, for those of you who know the Leslie Fay brand. I think that's kind of a blast from the past as well. Um, but she was a fit model for them. She joined Bloomingdale's in their training program, so she tried retail. Um, she followed a former boss to Victoria's Secret and, and was in the catalog division, and, and that's when I, you know, when I hired her. When I left Ralph Lauren, and we actually closed the, the brand. It was a license from the Polo organization, and we closed the brand, and that's when I left Sara Lee. Um, she went on to join the Bally brand, and Bally is a much more full figure oriented and much more technically oriented. She has five patents. And she's not a designer, but the patents are in her name uh, because of the concepts that she came up with. I mean, she's such an interesting person because she is probably one of the most creative people I've ever worked with, but she's also very process-oriented and, and, and has the business side to her. So she's this amazing combination. 
and because of her creativity, she has the patents. Um, she's been with Warnico now about two years, heading up merchandising. She and Dawn are the pair that would have created you know, some of the bras that we've recently introduced. And as I said, we've recently added tech design to her responsibilities, tech design being the people who actually um, do, the designers tend to fit to a certain um, three sizes and then it's graded from there, so tech design takes over. Uh, Joanne's not a fitter, but she's a leader. And so she is now leading the tech design area um, to, to take us to the next level of expertise. Kathy Linehan is Joanne's counterpart on this Calvin Klein brand. So again, just like Yarden, Kathy is responsible for the globe. So she has to balance the needs of different marketplaces. Um, she travels the world. Um, because of that, because she, the merchants need to know the competition, and s because that's how you know you, you can really know whether you're, you can set that product idea apart. So she's going to travel the world to look for ideas and also look at the competitive set uh, for Calvin Klein wherever it is distributed. She also, you know, has has a creative background. She, her mother taught her to sew. Of course, my mother taught me to sew, but um, I can't sew. Um, but but she actually can. Um, she also joined FIT's fashion buying and merchandising program, and then began her career in retail. But but in 1995, so a while ago, she joined Intimate Apparel and certainly hasn't looked back. And loves the Calvin Klein business because it gives her both women's as well as men's. So she's she you know she's got a you know there's one brand image, but she's got to balance the needs of the two industries uh, and the globe. Okay, and then the the last person on the team I, I I wanted to profile for you just to give another flavor. Jill Getkowski um, is the regional merchandising manager for Calvin Klein, so she handles the U.S. So she is kind of my team's representative for both men's and women of the U.S. needs, and her primary responsibility then would be to interface with the global merchants to represent the needs of the U.S as the global group is trying to develop things that answer everyone's needs. Um, you know, she, her career combines her passion for fashion and marketing. She actually started on the marketing side. Um, you know, and, and I guess maybe she and Melissa got together. Melissa was a nurse, she was gonna be a vet, um, and she, you know, joined a, a marketing club. And I think, you know, when she says she became aware of fashion, I think that means she liked to shop. Um, and, you know, she, but she was very conscious about what are people wearing, you know, who's who in designers. I mean, as I said, I think she, you know, she certainly um, had a personal um, need, for, not, personal love for, for what was going on in fashion. Like Joanne, she graduated from Skidmore, and like jo you know, Joanne actually hired her as, um, you know, as an intern. Uh, at one point, so the world is a very small place. So Skidmore got her to Joanne. She liked fashion. Um, Joanne basically, you know, she interned with both Joanne actually and Kathy because they were together at one point uh, at at Sarah Lee. She actually joined as a marketing person, but has has migrated to the merchandising side of that. And right now she's working on her MBA. So she's she's really got a very broad background, very young, but very broad background as she's finding, you know, while out how she wants to apply herself in this industry. And then, I, as I said, I, I would reprise myself uh, with my background because it, I, I, I focus primarily on creative people who are in the merchandising and design team. There are also forecasters, there are supply chain people, there are production planners, there, there are um, very technical people, finance people. Um, the, you know, the company and the, the business is made up of all different backgrounds. Um, as I said, my background was much more on the marketing side and consumer packaged goods. And when I took that skill set and applied it in apparel, and in intimate apparel specifically, I, I declared that I would never go back because this is a much faster pace. It's a much more intuitive uh, industry, whether you're, you, you, know, you actually make a pattern or not. So the creativity side of the brain gets a challenge because there is no crystal ball. And there's, if you research it to death, um, 
which we sometimes did in the consumer packaged goods world, the, the trend has changed. It's too late, so you can't really do that. You sometimes have to, you have to research things, the strap, you show it to consumers, you do wear tests, you do that kind of research on what the consumer need and want is. But beyond that, you kind of have to hold your breath and, and go. And sometimes there are those failures, which of course I didn't include. Um, but those are the things that help you, set you up for the next one to say, you know what, here's what we did wrong, here's, here's what we learned, here's how, here's how we can go forward. Um, so I, I, I love this industry and I love the people in this industry for all of those reasons, even though I play a much more, um, a less, a cr different, cr my creativity is applied in a very different way. Um, and I, part of that is trusting the people who know uh, to do their jobs and, and, and identifying in them the kind of the strength and the, the power that they have. So at this point, I would be more than happy to open it up for any questions that you might have on Warnico, on the industry, on what's going on out there, um, and I didn't mean the today's wind, but just this economy, the, glo the globe I'll probably be a little more fuzzy on, but I'll do my best, um, but any questions that you might have for me. Yes. In all of you, the question is there's, you know, the number of stores for Calvin Klein in the U.S., and there is right now only one, and that is in Soho. The, the intention is to open more in the U.S. The time frame is undetermined at this point, and part of that has to do with uh, the economy, quite frankly. Part of that has to do with learning. I mean, the, the, the stores in Europe that we have, many of them are outlets, quite, quite honestly, so we're learning there. Um, we own those, and it gives you control. Um, but, but at this point, you know, we're, we are learning, and the economy kind of you know, put a little bit of a, a break on some of the, um, the expansions, but it will happen. I mean, our, our goal for Calvin Klein underwear is to be a billion dollars. I mean, that's basically double what we are today, and direct-to-consumer is an important part of that, not only, you know, around the world, but here in the U.S. Yes? I was going to say, I'm going to... Well, Ralph, Sarah Lee licensed the Ralph Lauren name, and it was a five-year license. And um, I actually was involved with the brand the last two and a half to three years of that, so I actually did not launch the brand. I would happen to be working in Canada when it was um, launched on pantyhose, of all things. Um, so I know a little bit about those machines. But, but um, it was a licensed brand that both parties decided not to renew. You know, and there's all kinds of reasons for that. I think on the polo side, um, they, they didn't love the industry. Because it, it frankly is a, the, the competitive set is, is highly promotional. So if you go into Macy's, if, uh, you know, we're not that far from Herald Square. So if you went into Macy's right now, and I'm not exactly sure what you'd see, in, the, in what we call the moderate bras, which Warners and Olga's would be a player, buy two, get one free is sort of, like if you don't buy them on sale, you, you know, you're, you, you're almost trying. I mean, they're always on sale, and that's a negative in the, in the moderate side. Um, whereas the designer brands are not on sale. But, but so the polo organization didn't really like how promotional the industry really was. And from a Sara Lee perspective, because we were restricted by the license from on a distribution standpoint and didn't have the global rights to the, you know, it was hard to make the numbers work. So it was sort of a mutual parting, very friendly. We closed it wisely. Um, and they have not, they, they are in the daywear business, but not the bra business. And, and that's, I'm, I'm putting words in their mouth, but that's really um, their reason at the time why, that it was just an industry that, that was, that they didn't understand very well from that standpoint, and it didn't match what they, where they wanted to be. Okay, but it was a lot, I mean, it's, they're, it's, it was a fun brand as well. Um, you know, Calvin, it, we, because we own it and have it worldwide, it's, more fun, actually, because there's more power there, and we have, you know, the ability to do, we, do, we don't do buy two, get one free, but we have the ability to do some things we might have been, not have been able to do on Ralph Lauren. Yes?
Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm going to try and do that without giving you years because that would be, you know, like highly embarrassing for me. But, but um, I'll do, you know, I, you can probably figure it out because, you know, um, it doesn't lie probably. But, but I actually got my undergraduate degree. I grew up in Wisconsin. Anyone here from Wisconsin? All right, you know. Yeah. Um, and I, I, uh, I actually grew up in the northwest part of Wisconsin, you know, where it goes, Minnesota, right there. Um, but I went to school in the southeast part of the state at a small liberal arts school called Lawrence University. Anybody heard of it? Um, but uh, and I, my major was actually, I had a dual major, psychology and economics, you know, and and. Um, but it wasn't the kind of psychology as in therapy and and all of that. It was more the cognitive side. And I decided to, that I wanted to go, I actually decided, this is the true story, um, I thought I should become an industrial psychologist. And, um, and that was somebody who would take psychology and actually apply it in business. And my advisor, my psychology professor advisor said, I, I want you to do some research. You know, this was in Appleton, Wisconsin, which is home of Kimberly Clark, a lot of the paper industry. And I want you to do some research. Find out how many industrial psychologists there are in this area. And I, you know, I did my research too. You know, it's like not a lot uh, was, the, was the right answer. And he said, I actually think you should go get your MBA because it's two years versus three years and it's much broader. And so I said, oh, okay, you know, I mean, like, what did I know? And so that's what I applied and then deferred. I actually recruited for my college for two years. I decided I really wasn't ready uh, to go straight to school. I, my, my father was postmaster in our town. My mother was a ha yeah, homemaker. I didn't have a business, I didn't grow up in a business background. And so I just kind of needed a little bit of a break. And so I worked for the, for the college I loved and, and went around and talked to 17-year-olds. And then I went back for my MBA at Northwestern. And I found out in my first advertising class that advertising and cognitive psychology are the same thing. Because it really, I was learning, I, I was literally getting a review of my degree um, and finding out that cognitive psychology, the reason I loved it was how people remember things and how they make decisions. And so a marketing career was born in that aha moment um, because that was my passion about, you know, what I, what I loved in, in college. And so, you know, I happened to be in the right place because Northwestern is known for its marketing. And I, after graduating, I then joined General Mills. And at the time, and, and I mean, we're really talking the early 80s, and I mean the really early 80s. You can figure it out. Um, you, there were three places to go with a marketing degree in packaged goods. You either went to Procter, you went to General Foods, or you went to General Mills. And I went to General Mills partly because it was in Minneapolis, which was near my hometown. And that's the real honest answer. And partly because it was more of a general management view of marketing. Um, and so, and I loved it, you know, and I spent 10 years there and then at one, you know, I got married and we moved east and so I joined Nestle and Nestle moved the office to California and then I was trying to, okay, now what? Now, and I literally was in the job market and I went for an interview with Playtex and a number of other packaged goods company. I went for an interview with Playtex Apparel, which had been purchased by Sarah Lee um, and the president of Playtex Apparel was a Proctor alum and he wanted a marketing person kind of in his image, so to speak, because he wanted somebody that he, who would get it from, the, from a packaged goods approach to marketing, that it wasn't, marketing was not about hang tags, just. Marketing was about getting in the consumer's brain about why she was going to open her purse to make that purchase, or him, but, but in, in the case of women's intimate, it's predominantly purchased by women, and even men's, intimate, men's underwear is predominantly purchased by women. So, so you know, and, and then I, so it was kind of a little bit by accident in a way, um, because I had, you know, I looked at other opportunities as well. I didn't say, okay, now I think I'm gonna go to an apparel company, and I wouldn't go back. I mean, they probably wouldn't take me back, but I wouldn't go back because, for all the reasons I told you, it is much more fluid and intuitive, and the people are more, you know, creative. I mean, the design, you know, it's just a, it's a more, to me, to the right person, it's, a, it's more fun. Um, even though what, what I might do every day for many of the people in the room might be, you know, less fun than certainly the design part of it. Um, because I'm, you know, looking at the spreadsheet. I'm the one that looks at the spreadsheets, but I think they're fun. 
But that, you know, so that's kind of the, so I've probably now spent as much time, I've, I've got to think about this, probably more time in, in apparel, and most of that is intimate apparel. The only non-intimate apparel that I've had is probably three years of my time with Sara Lee. I went up to Toronto and ran the, first the isotoner business there and basically shut, changed the office to where my job was not needed to be more of a sales and merchandising arm because it was the same product um, and then moved to our hosiery business. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but it, was, it wasn't a, I didn't wake up when I was a kinder, in kindergarten and say, oh my God, I'm gonna sell bras for a living um, either. And, and most people don't, but it is a really fun industry. So if you haven't had exposure. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. We'll get both. <laughs> Boy, that's a, that's a good question. If you didn't hear the question, it has to do with the economy. Um, for those of you who are graduates, is, is there any advice that I can, I can give? And, and the first thing I'll say is that they are tough times. Um, they will end, but that doesn't make them any easier while we're in them. And, and part of that is the consumer is not sure. I mean, we're all more cautious about it. Even people that don't need to be, let alone there are, you know, there are, there, there are people that we all probably know who have lost their jobs and, and it makes it more difficult. And I think the advice, so it, it's, and it's uncharted waters. I mean, it, this is something none of us have lived through. So the advice I would give is to just be very, very true to your passion, find experiences that build your resume and your experience so that, you know, you know, find ways and be, you know, be resourceful about not only your own selfish side of resourcefulness in terms of I need that in, I want that internship, I want that experience, I, you know, but it's resourcefulness of if you get that opportunity, you know, be the person that they can't live without, you know, I mean, in a, in a way, I mean, that's, you know, what you need to do because it, and it's not about hours, you know, if you go back to my creativity, you know, it's about that, because at the end of the day, we're not stopping making product. We're not introducing fewer bras or fewer briefs or, you know, for men. We're not doing less of it, because it's even more important. Because if, if she goes to the store and it's the same old, same old, it'll be worse. We need to, you know, we need those ideas and we need that creativity. And the most important thing we can do is develop the product and then have the sales arm to do it, to sell it. And the people who do spreadsheets are the ones that are, you know, it's like, hmm, I mean, really, it, that's, that's probably the, you know, there's fewer numbers to read, perhaps, or however you want to look at that. But the product part of it and the passion behind that is critical in this industry. So find the experience. I know there was a question up here that we cut, I cut off. Do I, the question is, do I see any licensing uh, between Spanx and Warners? And, and you know, well, I might. I'm not sure Sarah Blakely does. Um, so, you know, we're not in, in conversations about that. She is, you know, I, and I've had the opportunity to meet her. She's, she's quite an interesting woman. She's very unassuming. She has bras out there now, you know, and, and, um, and I know she's in partnership because she doesn't really know bras, but, but she has a technology. I mean, if you talk to the creativity, and I mean, she started with the, the bottom, but she's now said, how can I make the back smoother? And that's her point of difference in a bra. So she's kind of taking the technology in a pullover, you know, anyway. Um, but, but I think that she's got her own plans there. So, you know, I don't, I don't think there'll be a partnership, but I wish I, I wish I were her, you know. <laughs> but um, she's really done a great, great, um, it's, a, it's a really interesting story. Uh, the question is how we recruit people, and okay, and well, and, and internships can be part of that. Um, you know, recruiting. The fundamental st story would be: gee, if we have a job open, a position open, then we'll tip. You know, the recruiting could be: you know, we post it on Monster, or we all of those the usual things. Um, 
Internships is a little bit different. Um, internships can, you know, we probably, we had a, a um, internships can sometimes happen through contacts, uh, to be honest with you. Um, if, if in those years where we've had a formal internship program, obviously, you know, people have found their way, way to the company. Um, Today, you know, for this coming summer, and that's really when we have we have interns. It's really up to the person to say, "I would like an intern," and then there there's a process in place. So, what I would say to you is, if you're interested in becoming an intern, whether it's Warnico or another company, definitely get. If you know someone there, use that. And whether it's an internship or a job, I mean, I, I would tell you, use the contacts you have, network as you know as much as you can, meet people. I mean, when when you have things like this, you go meet them. If you ever at, at an industry event and you know Don Allen's there or something, I mean, you want to meet him. I mean, you you know don't hang with your friends, go meet him. Um, and then, but but also just contact usually through an through the HR because they're going to know who's looking for an intern and how to match it up. But make it interesting. You know, it's it's always going to be about how do you make yourself the brand. So if you think that way, you are the brand now. And so why are you, why you? You know, and that's what kind of what you have the approach I would encourage you to take is just kind of why why you? Why would even if someone's not looking in for an intern because interns to be honest for, you know can be work. Because you're trying, you know, the, you can't just say, here, go do this. I mean, interns, you know, there's, there's a mutual work involved um, from that standpoint. And so there's an investment on both parties' parts. So make it, you know, easy, if you will, to say, here's what I can contribute or how I see myself. And it might, you might end up doing something completely different, but you'll stand out. And, and we ha we have had intern programs, and they, you know, for a number of years, they get run differently each year, um, a little bit, just depending on on how um, who's in who's in charge to some extent. And then we're also learning through that process in terms of what's the best way to go about it. We do we will have interns this summer, um, and, and as I said, the way we're running it is we've asked people who. Which departments are looking for an intern? And it has to be real. It isn't somebody like you know just to go, you know, do stuff. It's it's got to be a you know an investment of both parts because because quite honestly, if you're an intern, and then you come back to school, I view you you know if you had a good experience, you're an ambassador for Warnico. If you had a kind of a so-so experience, your supervisor didn't spend any time with you, you were on your own, you weren't sure what you were expected to do, that's also, you know, an ambassador, but not a positive one. So to me, if someone in my group is going to have an intern, I want to make sure that they're willing to to make it a, a, a valuable experience. But, but those people have raised their hands, so, um, you know, I can, I can certainly um, you know, I, I'm going to guess if I asked who all wants an internship, I'd probably have about 50 hands up, right? Definitely is. Yeah. So give me your, you know, but but I and I can get, certainly give you my card at the end, um, and I would just simply make sure that you can have contact with me, and then I will ho I would hook you up with our HR. It's a little more limited this year. I will be honest and tell you that 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 we probably have limited internships. Um, but that doesn't, that does, the answer is not none. Um, the answer is, you know, I, we're basically requiring the person who wants the intern to develop, a, you know, like think about it and, and not just have some, some, you know, another set of hands uh, because they have to have, you know, sort of an expectation of what the responsibility is. Okay? Any other questions? Right. Well, how many of you are in the uh, intimate apparel program? Raise your hand. No one in intimate apparel. Oh.
That's right. We can, we can do it in a number of ways, but, but it is, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. Um, you know, there, it's a small, small industry, relatively speaking. I mean, it's a big industry in terms of dollars, but it's a relatively small industry in terms of people. Um, but you can be, uh, because it's not every, you know, the designers who end up, particularly in design, the designers who end up in intimate apparel can do, you know, very well very well from a from a financial reward standpoint because it's a more limited industry and you know it's not about the next Ralph Lauren or the next Calvin Klein or the next Diane Van uh, you know it's 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 really how to make that garment um, one of those creative things really work so it can be you know a fun industry and I certainly that's where people's passion comes uh, you know it, it's it's highly creative but also the technical side of it so if you have that bend that you like the technical um, you might consider it but it is also a nice a nice way to make a living um, at the end of the day I mean it's you know it can be very very um, very good for you Well, I think this was a great pleasure. I, well, I, th I thank you as well, because I will tell you this is probably one of the more fun parts of my day. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you.